Yeah. <laughs> You're listening to Autodesk's Digital Builder Podcast, a show that inspires construction professionals to innovate and use technology to improve how they build our world. I'm Eric Thomas, and I've been working in construction for nearly a decade. And now I have the privilege to sit down with industry trailblazers to hear how they're solving construction's biggest challenges and redefining the future of the built environment. Welcome to another episode of Autodesk Digital Builder Podcast. I am your host, Eric Thomas. We are again live at Autodesk University. I have the pleasure of sitting down with Ariana Cohn, a digital construction engineer with Timber Lab. And today we are gonna talk about what is the deal with mass timber? And it's a topic that's come up a great deal more in recent years. And we happen to have an expert sitting next to me, which I'm very grateful for. So we will get deep into the weeds. But aside from that, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me on Digital Builder. Uh, so excited to be back at AU this year after coming last year. Could it be a great, uh, great week. And I mean, the energy here is just super high and everybody's excited about what we're talking about right now. So I'm, I'm excited to continue building on this uh, momentum. But, you know, without further ado, let's dive into mass timber. And I'm going to just be on the nose at a high level. What the heck is it? Yeah, yeah. If somebody out there who's never heard of it or hasn't gotten deep in the weeds, what are we talking about today? Yeah, really good, simple question. Um, so mass timber as a product refers to structurally engineered wood and commonly that's, uh, we're referring to CLT, cross laminated timber or glue lam, glue laminated timber. And so those differ a little bit in their uses. CLT is closer to, if you think about Jenga blocks, the way that they overlap, it's kind of cross laminated in the name, um, used for panels and sometimes shear walls. And glue lam, glue laminated timber would really refer to post and beam. There's a number of other products as well, but usually at Timber Lab and in most popular mass timber projects, that's what you'll see. Okay. Um, but as a process, mass timber is really about like prefabricated elements, offsite construction, and encompasses you know all those different goodies. I'm excited to get into the prefab part too because the the perception or enthusiasm about it I think varies depending on who we're talking to and we'll get into that a little bit deeper in a few minutes. Obviously I think this is a buzzing topic at least in the circles that I hang out in. I don't know if that's a nerdy circle or not but it's it's definitely being talked about a whole lot more and I'd be interested Where's the pressure coming from that is making this groundswell of mass timber, you know, start to come alive in a way that I don't think we were seeing five, ten years ago? I would say it's not just in your circles. Um, I'm hearing it from all different places um, all over the country. Uh, I, I think everybody has a little bit of a different reason why they're so excited and why people are putting so much pressure on it. Number one, I think out of everything would be sustainability. So mass timber really has that element where it's, you, you feel good about building it. It's good for the people and it's good for the planet. So the amount of embodied carbon is so much less than in a traditional construction. Um, and even just the process for manufacturing. Um, aside from that, a really big reason for why GCs might be more interested is safety. Since there is so much that prefabrication, uh, that, that offsite construction that we're really shipping that kit of parts to site makes it so there's less onsite skilled labor needed, less work being done on site and it's so much safer. Uh, we see so much less accidents that can happen. Well, anytime you can pull more folks off the project site and reduce that complexity, I think it's a huge win. And you know, the last three years have been challenging for many reasons, but I think folks have started to take a closer look at that offsite construction approach, whether it's tied to mass timber or other prefabricated elements. I'm hopeful and optimistic that's gonna stick around because people have learned, oh, okay, we have less folks on site, yes, but we also control this environment in a way that, you know, you're in downtown San Francisco building or, you know, in a field in Iowa and it's raining. You know, there's there's so many nuances of prefab that I'm super bullish about, at least personally, as a you know construction technology nerd. But I'd love to take a look at some of those myths or misconceptions that I've seen. And I think everybody, as you alluded to, has some sort of opinion. What are you hearing that you'd like to just do away with? You hear it come up and you go, oh, gosh, please stop saying that or you know vice versa it just keeps getting repeated and you'd like to push that away before we get deeper into the joys of mass timber yeah absolutely i think the biggest one and that everyone's expecting me to say fire um so fire resistance in mass timber is a huge topic of research and debate it's really interesting because timber and wood in general actually has inherent fire resistant properties so wood forms this char layer a tree or mass timber forms a char layer around which actually slows the speed at which wood burns. And it's, it's a lot more predictable in the way it burns 
compared to like a steel building. We know exactly how it happens. It's a natural product and it has all those properties in it. So I would say that's the biggest myth that people are concerned about, architects and GCs, when they first start exploring the idea of mass timber. Makes sense. It's always a concern. I think it maps back to the safety part that we were talking about earlier. Is there anything else that comes to mind that, you know, you just like to push away or is that the, the, the main one that, uh, you know, is just frustrating, I guess? <laughs> uh, the second top tier one, I would say, is forestry management. So, again, people think mass timber, they think we're cutting down trees, we're doing deforestation, when that's actually not the case. So mass timber and lumber in general kind of actually puts an emphasis on forestry management and creating those sustainable forests. We're not harvesting old, large trees. That's, you know, we, that's in the past. No one does that anymore. We're really looking for younger trees, and it, it allows us to use those trees that might have in the past just been cut down and thrown away because we do still need to manage our forests no matter what protect against wildfires. Focusing on forestry management, we are really investing in protecting our forests. And there's a number of like certifications that different suppliers can have in order to prove that to everybody. That's the second largest one. I appreciate that. And as somebody who lives on the West Coast, I'm all too familiar, as you as well, mm -hmm. of just the severity of the wildfire issues that we have. And so it sounds like there's a really great opportunity to continue, like you said, to, to manage that and manage that process, but build that renewable resource. And I think that's a really neat uh, nuance as well. It's just been in the last few years that I've learned the, the carbon emissions of you know concrete in contrast to other building methods. And it's it's a lot. Like, I don't have the statistics off the top of my head, but anything that we can do to start reducing that footprint, it sounds like a really great win. Let's get a little bit deeper into the benefits. I'd be interested to hear, you know, compared to some of those more traditional building methods, especially anything we haven't covered already that, you know, we really should focus on or people are very bullish about with regards to mass timber. We already covered safety, but I would say that's the number one benefit, um, as well as just that the speed of construction. So, Due to the nature of prefabricated off-site construction, removing it from the actual site where the building is going to be, like we can take six weeks or more off the schedule wow. from compared to a typical building. Which is wild considering how our fast track schedules are these days, where exactly. the expectations are so high. So that's huge. Yeah, yeah. So that's really exciting. It reduces the need for skilled labor on site. You know, there's labor shortages all around. Um, and it, it creates that kit of parts where we get to just basically make an Ikea assembly booklet, ship it to site and just assemble it there. So it's it's fast, it's safe, less costly in terms of labor. Um, and it's also, it's lighter, it's so much lighter. So not only are we eliminating concrete in a big portion of the actual occupied building space, but we're also eliminating a lot of the foundation need just because of the nature of the lighter material. That makes a lot of sense. And and I love the the continued emphasis on prefab as well. I've had um, Amr Rafat from Windover on the past to talk about prefab specifically. And he enlightened me to showcase that many people think ugly square box when they think prefab. They go, oh, you're going to go build this thing in a factory and it's going to be poorly constructed, but it's cheap and fast. And I think so many folks are showcasing that that is absolutely not the case now. And a lot of the, the mass timber like elements that I've seen in facilities now are actually quite beautiful. It's it's a really impressive structure that we get to build. And so I'm, I'm encouraged that we're starting to do way more and more often with some of those general prefab myths, but it sounds like mass timber has a, a huge role to play in, you know, just the broader conversation there. Yeah, absolutely. I think the thing that people think about when they think about prefabrication is modular, when that, those two things don't exactly mean the same thing. Prefabrication really just refers to offsite before we're there. Um, so those two things don't always have to be in the same realm. And most of the time we're actually not doing, I've never really worked on a strictly modular building. Everything that I'm working on is, is unique. <laughs> I appreciate you pointing that, that, that differential out because there's an overlap, but you can be in two different areas depending on what you're actually building. So that's, that's really cool. Let's think about it on the other hand now. So of course, what are, what are some of those limitations that might come with mass timber that folks need to consider if they're, you know, building this, uh, into the facilities they're working at? Biggest limitation that we're seeing right now is code adoption, just because it is a newer industry in the US. I mean, they've been doing it in Europe for decades at this point. Code adoption in terms of using mass timber for different structural applications like lateral or seismic or um, anything like that. There's a number of individuals, including like at Timber Lab and, and outside that are conducting research daily and helping to aid that process of um, adopting more codes in, in all jurisdictions, yeah. proving that mass timber can work in many different applications. It's such an interesting nuance about any new technology as well. I've, I've seen similar conversations tied to 3D printing in buildings because, again, they, they 
don't feel like they can certify it as safe or anything because there's not the requirements as clearly as they might have in Europe or I'm seeing in Dubai, they're far more progressive in the building, you know, facades and everything they're considering. And I think we have a little bit of catching up to do in the U.S. at times. I mean, yeah. uh, our friends in EMEA and APAC uh, are doing some cool stuff that we could learn from. So hopefully we're, you know, pushing the envelope as best we can and making people feel confident that their facilities are safe and, you know, good to build. But, you know, if you don't have a standard to adhere to, it's hard to, you know, come to the table and go, this is good to go. What are the height limitations specifically I'm curious about? I'm not sure. I think it depends on jurisdiction. Right now, um, Timberlab, we actually finished up the project down in Milwaukee Ascent, which was I don't know off the top of my head um, in foot, but it's 19 stories of mass timber on top of, I think, six stories of concrete podium. That's wild. Um, so we're pushing the limits for sure. <laughs> I, I love that, you know, and I think that does away with another myth that many people might experience as far as, oh, one, two, three stories because they might f feel that there's some strength issues. But as you alluded to, the weight difference probably is kind of that balance there as far as how high you can go and how all of that comes together. So yeah. I, I appreciate that. But your role specifically at Timberlab, I think, is, is quite unique, especially being that link between the prefab facility, your design teams in the field, and everybody who's actually out installing it. Can you tell me a little bit more about the mission and how that relates to your day-to-day -day responsibilities? Like, you know, what's a day in the life? Yeah, absolutely. So the mission of Timberlab is really just to push that mainstream adoption of mass timber construction in whatever way we can. And for everyone at the company, it kind of means different things. And that's why we offer like a, a huge range of services from pre-con to delegated engineering to my role at digital construction, all the way from fabrication to install. My day-to-day -day starts at pre-construction and goes all the way through install. So I'm, I'm on every phase of the project in different roles. So it really depends week to week how many projects I'm on, what, what phase the project is at. If I'm in a design assist role, I'm meeting with engineer of record and the architect of record weekly in order to help kind of work through some detail issues or any concerns that they might have. If it's towards the end of the project, then I'm calling site or I'm calling the fabrication facility daily or I'm actually out there daily helping to um, solve any issues or kind of clear up any confusions that might have happened between the transfer of 3D digital content into a 2D shop drawing. Really, my role is about making that runway to efficient fabrication and install, making the lives of anybody who might touch the project while or after I'm on it easier. Um, so we're solving clashes of every single screw months ahead of time before anything's ever on site, billets are even ordered. That's really the, the goal there is to be as risk averse as possible um, and solve those issues ahead of time. It, it makes a lot of sense. And, and I think it, it kind of pokes a finger in the eye of the, the myth that I hear oftentimes or the pushback that I hear about prefab where folks say, well, it never lines up when we go install it in the field or there's a disconnect and they built this thing, but it doesn't work here. Like those are some of the common grumblings I hear tied to prefab. And I, I think what you've just shared is, is the answer to that question. I mean, if you don't have a you somewhere that's actually behind the scenes ensuring that all this comes together, I can see where a gap might be introduced where you get into the field and something changed. You go, this doesn't line up anymore. And I, I empathize with the frustration in that. But if your process is dialed in, I feel like it's, it's a great process. And you know all of the, the benefits that we were talking about just a few minutes ago really do come together. So uh, I'm sure they're very thankful for you being on site. And uh, I hope that they, uh, they continue to bring more on staff as you build out the, uh, the kind of role. But building on you know, the ramblings of myself just a moment ago, I'm curious, how do you get that buy-in? So say you find that super who tried something with prefab 10 years ago and it didn't work and you, you know, missed a schedule or something because they had to remake something and rebuild it. How do, you, how do you convince them that this is the way and that this prefabricated process is actually going to you know, achieve what you've been telling them at the beginning of the project? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with um education and clearing up those misconceptions because again prefabrication just means making it off-site it doesn't mean that it's it's made without context so everything that we're doing is with context with every other trade and every other uh, building material so steel and concrete we're coordinating with them th all throughout that i think explaining that and showing that um, we also love to bring people by our fabrication facility and show them the accuracy with which our cnc machine operates and our whole process and also just listening, talking about what happened and what can we do to ensure that it doesn't happen again. We have a lot of experience from all different people at our company with <laughs> so much mass timber knowledge combined that if there's a problem, somebody probably has an answer.
That's awesome. Next time I'm in Portland, I'm going to have to come knock and check out Absolutely. the uh, facility because yeah. it sounds like you're doing some some cool stuff. The education piece is so important because you only get to make a first impression one time. And so if you're bringing somebody in who hasn't worked with Mass Timber and you haven't set that expectation well or something has been misaligned and they feel they were misinformed or something, it's so much harder to bring them back to the fold and say, hey, OK, we're going to do it again. And they go, the heck we are. You know, it's, it's a very different conversation. So it sounds like you've got this, this multi-layered approach to both making sure everything lines up and, you know, everybody is understanding what's going on, but understanding the why and the nuance too. I think it really does come back into a broader culture conversations. Let's pivot away from just mass timber today. I'd be curious to hear what are some of your favorite trends that are happening in the industry? Or do you have any predictions right now for things that might happen in the next five or 10 years with regards to you know construction and construction technology? I'd be interested to hear what you're nerding out about. I nerd out mostly about software and mass timber. <laughs> so both of my excitements are around that. Um, like I said earlier, a lot of research is being done right now to test mass timber for different structural elements. So eliminating more steel for more wood, uh, wood to wood bearing. Um, I'm really excited about potential of that and how we can utilize mass timber in all different ways. I think the next decade will really bring more of an emphasis on that prefabrication just because construction is so disruptive to our cities. Um, the less time that we can spend on site, the better for all different reasons. Um, and as we continue to build and continue to expand and, and uh, revitalize spaces, we want to have as little disruption as possible. So the more prefabricated offsite construction that we can have, the better. I, I think it's huge and it, it requires, you know, like your lay down area isn't going to be as massive, like the footprint that you're having and say in San Francisco or Seattle or Portland or something, it's a different conversation. And unfortunately folks don't, who aren't in our industry or joint nerds like we happen to be, <laughs> They don't love the idea of construction sometimes, even though it impacts their lives so heavily and in really important ways and impactful ways. And so I love that focus on eliminating a little bit of that noise, a little bit about that, that tension and hopefully making the, the relationship between the contractors and the projects and the community a little bit less tense because you, you have a little less happening in that space. So that's a, a cool long-term focus. And you know, I, I catch myself sometimes, I get caught in new construction traffic and there's a brief like, boom, <laughs> like I met and I'm like, okay, no, no, like these are my people, it's fine. Like, <laughs> like we're gonna get where we need to go and it's gonna be okay. So I love that, there's, there's a lot of cool stuff on the horizon. And I think with technology and software in particular, as we start moving more and more into the cloud and finding our platform approaches and just really thinking through how our tools connect and communicate. It's such a game changer yeah. versus this disparate, disconnected, siloed, okay, I'm gonna manually copy all my data into this other tool. Like that's going away and I'm super thankful for it because there's a lot of tools out there. It's easy to get stuck in decision paralysis when you're trying to pick you know, your tech stack and what you're gonna do. So that's cool. Let's think uh, one more tool question for you. If you had one tool you had to pick that you're going to use on every project that you work on, what would that be? Um, we're going back to software again. I would say scheduling and Revit. It's, it's such a powerful tool that I think I didn't realize I used constantly for a while. But like you said, manually inputting data, manually moving things over for that interoperability between different trades or between even um, you know, myself in the office and the fabrication facility and the on-site. Using scheduling makes that so much easier. Um, so yeah, I love <laughs> I love scheduling. I like it, and I know all the Revit fans out there are probably <laughs> pumped up right now as well. So, well, thank you so much for joining me on this episode of Digital Builder. I very much appreciate it. And of course, everybody out there listening today, I'm your host, Eric Thomas. You can find me on Twitter at builder underscore digital or X or whatever the heck it's called these days. It doesn't really matter. Or out on LinkedIn. I'm the only Eric Thomas that works for Autodesk. We are on YouTube. We are a video first podcast, also on Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Anywhere else you might look for us, we're likely going to be there. And until the next time, goodbye.